Well, very happy to see you, Anita, your family and uh, friends from the wonderful world of entertainment. And here, to claim the throne next to yours, a queen guitarist, your husband, Brian May. Brian, there is one number of yours that has a, a special meaning for you both. Ah, yes. It goes back to the very first days when I, I met this wonderful lady before she was, was mine. Um, she kind of had a zest for everything and wanted everything all at once and she used to say, I want it all and I want it now. <laughs> and a uh, <laughs> little bell went off in my head and I thought, hmm, make a nice song. And I had, it, I had it going around in my head for ages and ages, eventually wrote the song and the band did it, Queen did it, and when it got to number one, I had her made a gold disc which said thank you to Anita Dobson for the inspiration to this song. Oh, so, <laughs> what a story. I got a gold disc. <laughs> <laughs> She's got loads of them now. <laughs> well, Anita, you certainly collected millions of fans and many awards as Angie Watts, long-suffering landlady of the Queen Vic, where many have suffered since. But it's only part of the story, as we shall show. As a taster, here's the pick of Dobson's choice. Mabel's the nursery maid. And all I can say to you about her is good luck, because you're certainly going to need it. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> Where are you, darling? All sussed. Oh, thanks very much, Jim. It's a lovely picture now. Well, you say that again, yeah. <laughs> Again, and Angie Watts picked up the trophy for the most popular personalities on British television. Landlord and landlady of the Queen Vic, who are played by Leslie Grantham and Anita Dobson, collected their awards from Princess Anne at a ceremony this morning. Nana! Nana! Come down here now! Now, do you hear now? I must ask you. It's all right, thank you. You can leave this with me now, thank you. What is it? Oh, good evening, Mr. Bell. Hello, Norma. What, what do you want? You just had to have him, didn't you? Somebody else is, and you just had to have him. He should be here, but at the last minute he said he wasn't able to come. Oh, pressure the work. No. Feel help. No. Fear of flying. Pig ignorance. Clashed with the FA Cup. Have you had any contact with George Ralph lately? What's it to do with you? How did you feel when he was sent down for 25 years? Upset you? I've taken the nose off a bitch for a remark like that. Well, Anita, this year marks your 32nd anniversary in the business. In that time, you've done it all from Shakespeare to Sondheim. In 1998, you were nominated for an award for your performance in the play Frozen. Sharing the stage during that run was the star of the recent revival of The King and I, the London Palladium, Josie Lawrence. Josie, you've shared the stage and you've shared an address. Yeah, we live together in Birmingham. Uh, Anita, to me, is like one of these wonderful chocolate bars. I can't mention it by name, but it's the one that helps you work less than play. Because uh, we rested together, we lived together. And she looked after me, she cooked all the food, and our favourite tipple was pickled onions, remember? The old-fashioned jars, not the mamby pamby cocktail variety. They're great big pickled onions that made your eyes water when you crunched them. And then we played together because she's the only friend I've got that phoned me up one day and said, do you fancy coming to George Michael's birthday party? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've got a photo of it. There we are. Now, that actually wasn't a fancy dress do. We do actually go out looking like that. And then, of course, we worked together on Frozen, which was a very, very heavy piece. Um, Anita played the mother of a child who'd been missing for 20 years and had been murdered and her remains were eventually found. S and she was a revelation. She was absolutely wonderful and every night on the Tanai when she did her final speech, uh, it would make me cry and make everyone else cry and it made me realise just what a brilliantly talented actress you are and I want to see more of you and I'm sure I'm not alone in that, am I? More, more of Anita Dobson. <laughs> Thank you. 
We like to cover a few miles in this show, so let's hear from a good friend who's 3,000 miles away in New York, Elaine Page. Anita, hello. I hope you're having a fantastic evening. In all the years I've known you, we've never ever worked together, but I do remember that you always wanted to be the singer and I always wanted to be the actress. How did we manage to get our wires so crossed? <laughs> what I love about you is that you always bring such a wonderful sense of enthusiasm and sunshine to everything in life and you have that wicked sense of naughtiness. So please don't ever change, you're an absolute one-off and you're loved and adored by all your friends. Please give my love to Brian and don't forget I'm going to see you here in New York in uh, well, just over a week for some more fun. <laughs> so get ready. <laughs> Lots of love and have a fabulous evening. God bless. Well, Anita, your very first appearance was at Bancroft Road Hospital in Stepney in the East End of London on April the 29th, 1949. Your father, Alf, worked as a pattern cutter in the rag trade and your mother, Anne, was a seamstress. You have a younger sister, Gillian. When you were born, the family were living in your granny's house in Rhodeswell Road, Limehouse. She kept rabbits, or so you thought. <laughs> Auntie Joan, this is a favourite family story. <laughs> yeah, she had a lively imagination, and I was at my mother's house one day, and uh, this little mouse came down the stairs. She called out, Nan, you know you've got rabbits on your stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, what was, it, what was it like growing up in the East End? Well, I have, I have only good memories, I suppose, but it was mm. quite... Um, it was exciting in our house. There's never a dull moment. Well, let's take a tour of the old place, shall we? Our guide, the man you loved to hate, Dirty Den himself, alias likeable Leslie Grantham. Hello, darling. Hope you and the old man are going to have a great time tonight. Now, I know that you're going to be with friends and family. But have you clocked this place? Yes, that's right. It's the Prince Regent, where your dad used to bring the whole family down here for a few drinks before you went home for the Sunday roast. Oh yeah, I know. Soft drinks only for Anita. Unlike someone I know. Andrew, you've had enough. Who is a bit partial to litres of the old mother's ruin. I'm now going to take you on a guided tour down memory lane. Back to the real East End. Here's the council flats where you grew up in Stepney. And it was here you began to entertain all your relatives at family dues. One Christmas, you even formed your own impromptu orchestra, Anito's Mambo Band. By the age of five, you were already an entertainer, singing and dancing at family knees-ups and doing acrobatics for the Ivy Travers troupe. East Enders Love Street parties, and you're no exception. You still treasure the photos taken at the coronation celebrations in 1953. By the age of 11, you were attending drama classes at Toynbee Hall in Commercial Street. It was there you got your first taste of proper acting, and you realised you had the gift to make audiences laugh and cry. I know you've always been proud of your East End roots. And I've always been proud of having worked with you on East Enders. You know, the husband and wife, always at each other's throats, round and dishing the dirt on each other. But in reality, mates, and I think it's great that you've gone on from being a big soap star to an even bigger stage and screen star. I wish you all the best. Love you. From the age of five, you were a pupil at John Skur School in Cephas Street in Stepney, just a short scamper from your block of flats. And Anita, do you remember the day we built our own makeshift stage? You haven't seen him for many a long term, teacher Norman Holland. And you got me started. <laughs> Do you remember the show we put on, and Alice in Wonderland, oh, yes, forget, and all our galaxy of stars that we had then, there was one star whose light shone a little brighter than the rest. It's a little girl called Anita. No, oh, you are. Thank you so much.
that when you were 11 you went a scholarship to Coborn Grammar School for girls in Bow. One of your teachers from those days is here. Then she was Miss Faircliffe and now she's Mrs. Molyneux Berry. Present company accepted, you didn't actually enjoy Coborn Grammar a lot, did you? No, I didn't. It leaned very heavily towards the academic and um, I wasn't very good at that side of things. <laughs> I was a bit more arty, but Miss Faircliffe, she kind of encouraged me to, to the English art and things like that, so she helped me a lot. She kind of saved me, really. Well, you leave school at 16 with four O-levels, and you get a job as a clerk with Prudential Insurance at Holborn. And when you join the Saturday morning acting class at Toynbee Hall, one of your fellow hopefuls was Mark St. Clair. Mark, Anita stood out. Uh, very much so. Um, I can remember one occasion after um, we were rehearsing a musical called Oi, and uh, Anita was playing Mother Superior, she had the great idea that after rehearsals, we all go to the local pub, but she would keep her mother superior outfit on. <laughs> she made a grand entrance into this East End pub, full of mostly villains. They reached for their pockets, thinking it's a collection. She walked to the bar and said, ten pints of lager, please. <laughs> In August 1968, a great adventure. The Bertha Myers Company from Toynbee Hall takes a mime drama set in London on a tour of Czechoslovakia. Another veteran of the Bertha Myers Company is currently having a great time in New York and the hit show The Producers. Sending regards from Broadway, your old friend Henry Goodman. Oh. You were a great inspiration when we were all running around full of enthusiasm. And being in the East End of London in these terrible, difficult tenements and so on, we didn't consider ourselves suffering. Life was fertile and exciting. But what was great about you was that with all of your energy, you had a real sensitivity and I think that's why you were constantly giving us notes out of how, how you could do things. But it came from a hunger to share the insights that you had. And that's wonderfully stayed with you all of your acting life. So when we worked together on, in the West End in Stephen Burkhoff's play, it was great to look across the stage and see that twinkle in your eye and know that you would go down and knock them dead and get humongous applause every night for your sensitivity and skill. Great physical technique and uh, I applaud it. Much love, Henry. You study drama at the Weber Douglas Academy in South Kensington. After graduating, you go off to the Glasgow Citizens Theatre and then perform in rep all over the country. Leslie Joseph, it was around that time that you met. It was around that time. We've known each other many, many years. And uh, we've never actually worked together, no. but I've always been a huge fan, especially of that fantastic singing voice that you have. And in fact, I have to tell you, in the early days, I always wanted to be Anita Dobson. And uh, just recently, I was filming, and an extra came up to me and said, Oh, my God, oh, my God, are you Anita Dobson? Because I've worked with you, and I think you're brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> now, as you know, I think you are brilliant, and I'm thrilled to be here tonight Ditto, and see this celebration. In 1976, you spend a year at the Palace Theatre in Watford, doing everything from Panto to Mel Coward and brand new plays. And Kate Williams, you were at the Watford Theatre. Oh yes, I was there. I was giving the Noel Coward at the time. <laughs> in one of the plays, Nietzsche was playing a particularly adenoid, unpleasant uh, young schoolgirl, and I was playing mother. <laughs> and I've been mother yeah. ever since. Yeah. <laughs> so much so that I was in Joe Allen's one night, and Nietzsche and Brian were at another table, and um, I understand that Mr. May excused himself from the table saying, excuse me, I've got to go and meet my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud to be family, Nate, and I love you very much. Now, in 1980, you have a go at children's television. You become a regular presenter on the classic show, Play Away. <laughs> you can't play away without Brian Kant. Brian, was not he a good playmate? Yes. It really doesn't matter if it's raining or it's fine, <laughs> just as long as you've got Anita in the company. She was a joy. Do you remember rehearsals? Every morning she used to call me Beeps. She used to come breathing in as bright as a button and attack my uh, upper extremities. <laughs> and uh, I, probably that's what made my hair fall out. So what you try, but if it does happen, put something in an envelope with a bit of gauze and send it to me. You're a joy. We all love working with you. God bless. In 1983, you take on the role of Kitty in a production of the famous farce Charlie's Aunt at the Lyric Hammersmith. It transfers to the Aldwych Theatre for a record-breaking run. The man who would be auntie is here, that fine farcer Griff Rhys-Jones.
thank you. Thank Show us your bustle, then. Well, now, this is going back a bit, isn't it? Actually, this was um, I, this was before uh, EastEnders, so we were we would all study, and this was actually I don't know if you remember this was my first appearance on stage. Yes, it was. I'd never done a professional, so I was totally reliant on people who knew what they were doing, and you can imagine Anita really knew what they. But and we used to get most fantastic lots, very happy production. Wasn't you were brilliant. It? it was just the most fun. We had so much fun doing that show. I have to tell you, this mm -hmm. man. We, we rehearsed, we opened, he got huge laughs, and all the way through the run, we're still inventing new business. I was just amazed at that. Well, you were do, you remember, do you remember the thing where we had the table? About the third preview, we had a, a card table, and we went, and we, we got up, and we just and went to put it down, and the table uh, collapsed under me. So it had legs that collapsed, and I had to go and put the whole thing down on the floor like that. And then and we, kept, we kept it in. Every night we kept this thing, we'd just sort of collapse and go down there. And every time, we used to meet people, didn't we, after and say, I was there the night the table collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, thank oh, you very that. much. Thank you. Thank you. It was in 1985 that you play your part in creating the BBC's most spectacular success ever. The first episode of a brand new soap is transmitted on February the 19th of that year and almost at once becomes the most talked about show in the country. The woes of alcoholic Angie and Dirty Den enthrall the nation. Don't get out your pram, Dennis! Well, get off my back. Look, I'm sorry if you think I'm having a go at you. It's just that I'd like to think while you're lying under that hot Mediterranean sunshine, you'd spare a thought for me here. Because I'll be thinking of you, you know. You lying, deceitful, adulterous toe rag, you. Look, Sharon, I've just been straight with you, and I? Look, Mum, I won't tell Dad if that's what you think. <laughs> I love you, Mum. Do you? I lied to him. I told him something that just wasn't true, and he believed me. If you ever found out, he'd kill me. Yeah, he would. He'd kill me. Feast your eyes on this little lot. What is it? My decree, nice eye. In six weeks' time, I am going to be Dennis Watts' ex-wife. And they've come out for a night up west. The cream of Walford. Mm. Your old mates from Albert Square, Bretton Franklin. Ross Davidson. Wendy Richard. June Brown. Pam St. Clement. Gillian Telford. Jane Hart. Shirley Cherokee. And Letitia Dean. Wendy, uh, take us back to day one. So I've started to cry, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> there was um, one write-up in particular after the first episode, and it said, Angie Watts has enough spark and vitality to light up the whole of Albert Square, and you did. Thank you. Gillian, you remember a few girls' nights out? Yes, yes, and uh, one in particular I remember is, uh, if Neats does, it was Neats, uh, Letitia, myself and Sue Talley that went out one night and uh, just visited a few drinking establishments, <laughs> as you do along the way, and we parked into a cab, stayed at Neats' flat, and you said it was brilliant, one bedroom flat there, and Sue Tully lost the bed, she had to sleep on the floor, <laughs> and me, me, Neats and Tish ended up spending the night in Neats' double bed, and it was brilliant, we laughed all evening, <laughs> we don't know what time we went to sleep, like two in the morning, but it was just one of those lovely, lovely evenings that I'll never forget, thanks for that very much, mate. Cheers. Wow, I like the sound of that one. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> Letitia, tell us about your screen mum. Well, thank you so much for looking after me and showing me the ropes, you're the best TV mum ever. 
Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Apart from you. <laughs> Do you know this? <laughs> The first day of my first rehearsal on the set, this little one, what were you, 16? Yeah, just. 16. Yeah. And she went off, and I was doing a little scene with Leslie, and there was a tap on the cell. She went, Yeah, mum, here's a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I've arrived, now I'm home. <laughs> well, when you leave the standard, your departure even makes headlines on the six o'clock news. But the character she plays, the ex wife of the pub landlord Dirty Den, will not be killed off in case Miss Dobson wants to come back says the BBC. Now, after 14 years out of sight but not out of mind, the word is that Angie is about to go the same way as Dirty Den. Can you put us out of our agony? I can. She's bother chop. She's off. She's out. She's going. How do you feel about that? I think it's time. I think it's definitely time. <laughs> After leaving EastEnders, you're determined to prove that as an actress you have much more to do. And you appear with acclaim in Molière's Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme and in the Stephen Burkhoff farce Kvetch. And now you're busier than ever. In 1999, you're in a revival of The Pyjama Game at the Victoria Palace. And most recently, you were at the Arts Theatre in the show nominated for an Olivier Award, The Vagina Monologues. But back to the telly. Two years ago, there was a moment in the series Hearts and Bones that gave us all a chance for a good snivel. Well, now to America to hear from Amanda Holden, who was playing your daughter. Over to Los Angeles. You had to play a, a, a woman who was terminally ill with cancer. And I remember we were all very excited to have you on board because we were massive fans of EastEnders and you're such a brilliant actress. Are you comfortable? Mm -hmm. Is there anything I can do? Just be here. Read to me. Hold my hand while I sleep. Um, Just don't mind. And we had to do our scenes, and they were really hard. I'm crying, and <clears throat> you're crying, and the crew was crying, and the big beefy sparks were crying, the director was crying, and then the camera stopped, and you went... Anyway, so, as I was saying, I think Harvey Nicks is the best place to buy your underwear. What do you think, Amanda? And I was like, yeah, no, I think so, I think so as well. And everyone fell about laughing. That's how you work. You're so good. You made the situation so brilliant off-camera that when we had to shoot the difficult scenes it, they were just perfect and it was down to you. Um, I'm really proud to be one of your friends and Les's as well. Lots of love. Most recently on the telly you've been on the other side of the law in the BBC crime series NCS Manhunt with 007's Miss Moneypenny, Samantha Bond. But, Anita, let's take one more trip back to Albert Square. As Angie packed her bags and flew off to Florida, another suitcase appeared in the hallway. That was mine, Anita. And while Angie was basking in the sun, they had me flogging at some for market, didn't they? That naughty Cindy Beale, Michelle uh Collins. started um, the day you left and um, so you always a, a bit of a, a myth to me and a, and a bit of an icon and um, it took 10 years for us to finally meet didn't it and um, I was doing sunburn and Anita came out to play a sort of Shirley Valentine character and I was absolutely petrified of meeting you and you came out and you were so lovely and fantastic and I was going through a hard time and you were so brilliant to Maya and I just want to say that um, I don't think East Enders would be the success today if it wasn't for you for your performance and I love you. I love you too. <laughs> to complete your happiness, 18 months ago, you and Brian were married in Richmond upon Thames. And Brian, that picture is a rarity. That's the picture that nobody saw, yeah. Um, we really wanted the wedding to be private. You know, we were determined that it was for family only, just and for us, and um, that we were going to keep the, the press out. So we kept it private, and no one's seen that until this, this time. So, one way or another, you've got it sorted. Finally, let me take you back to your childhood in the East End. Family gatherings were the highlights of your life, and it was at those parties that you took your first steps as an entertainer. Sadly, your father died some years ago, and your mother isn't in the best of health, but 
She was determined that she wasn't going to miss your big night. So with the permission of her doctors, she is here with family friend Laurie Gales, your mother, Anne. Next on BBC One, the National Lottery. <laughs> <laughs> 